farewell. I am uh, I'm extremely humbled to be standing here. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that if you would ask some people who knew me some years ago, I probably shouldn't be able to put two or three sentences together, let alone be standing here in front of you today. Um, so I'm real, I'm real, real grateful. I'm going to pray real quick. Uh, Father, we thank you for this day. Hallelujah. We thank you for your grace and your mercy once again, Lord God. We thank you for another opportunity to be of service to you. And Lord, right now I ask that you move me out of the way and that you use me any way you see fit. You call and I'll say yes. And I thank you. And if there's a harvest, Lord, I promise I'll give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so I, uh, whoo, I tried to talk God out of this. <laughs> I did. I really did. I tried to talk God out of this. And, um, I, I want to say thank you to, to the leadership who sees something in me. Uh, I'm real grateful and I'm humbled by that. Um, but I tried to talk God out of it and, uh, I reminded him of all the stuff I've done. <laughs> I was like, Lord, you do know who I am. And uh, he been talking to me all week. Yes, I know who you are. And then I'd have a thought about something. I said, Lord, did you see that? He's like, yep, I saw that. I saw that. I know who you are. And I'd say something. I'd be like, dang, I shouldn't have said that. Lord, you see that? You still want me to do this? <laughs> yep, I know who you are. And uh, so here I am. And um, I'm going to tell you, um, Standing here and looking out uh, on you guys, I'm, I am humbled also by the fact that this really has nothing to do with me. Um, check this out. So I was raised in the Church of Christ. I don't know if you guys know anything about the Church of Christ. But I was raised in the Church of Christ. My father was a Church of Christ minister. As a matter of fact, the minister's wife brought me home from the hospital. Me and my twin sister. And so I went from Kaiser to Church of Christ. Right? <laughs> so, and... Uh, no, for real, for real, for real, right? And, uh, and so uh, in the Church of Christ, uh, when I was coming up, um, as Revival Center started and began its ministry, and, and I was around, uh, Pastor Nutt was my high school counselor when Revival Center started. So I watched uh, people being changed right before my eyes at Hogan High School. I would go to school, man, and I would watch people, people that would, I, I, I knew them from the streets, and I watched them change, right? Overnight, pow. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. I watch people falling out of school. Oh, glory! <laughs> it was crazy. My sister, I tell you, she was there. Um, this is a true story, right? And, um, but at my church, people would say, actually, they talked really bad about Revival Center. And uh, there was a time when I would say that I would never, I wasn't coming over here. Well, what ended up happening was I came over here and never left, <laughs> right? But I said all that to say this. If you're related to me, will you please stand up? <laughs> Look at God. Then was some of them people that was never coming over here. <laughs> So I'm real, I'm real humbled. So listen, I'm not going to be before you long. As a matter of fact, I'm so nervous, I'm probably going to talk so fast. You better tape this, because you might <laughs> miss some. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, listen, I have a subject for you. I want you to write it down. When the Lord shuts the door. When the Lord shuts the door. So I didn't bring this Bible up here for nothing. I'm actually going to use it. Amen. 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 I watch Joel Osteen sometime on TV. He's a great speaker. And I, but I'd be waiting for him to open his Bible, and he never does. he talked talk for a half hour. Don't never open the Bible. He'd be like, when he going to open this Bible? So how many went to see Noah, the movie Noah? 
So recently, I actually thought I already had my message together. Uh, I spoke in Marin not long ago, and, and I had done this message on love. And I was sure that God wanted me to preach that message here. I, I was sure. And so I wasn't going to write nothing. I wasn't finna do nothing. I was cool. I had my message. I talked to Sister Ivy. Sister Ivy said, yeah, you need to do that, right? And uh, so I was going to do that. And then um, I, I have that Bible app. You know that Bible app you get on your phone, right? Bible.com or whatever, right? And, uh, and I always start these reading plans, and then I get behind. And then they got this feature that says, catch me up. So I'm always hitting the catch me up button, right? So one, one night I went to read my Bible plan, and I, hit, I had to hit catch me up because I was behind. And God took me to this passage, of script, this passage of scripture about Noah, right? It just happened to be, I'm at the beginning of the Old Testament, so Noah. And I started reading, and uh, three hours later, I was still writing, and my wife was, what is you doing? Why don't you come to bed, <laughs> right? Because she don't know. Like, the Lord woke me up. And, and I started writing, and so, so this is what I'm going to share with you today. I believe the Lord, the Lord has given me this word for you, and I hope that it encourages you uh, when the Lord shuts you in. So listen, the story of Noah is more than just a story about the flood or the boat uh, or even the destruction of mankind. It really also is a story about the love of God because God loved us so much that even though we were totally wicked, he refused to just wipe us out, right? He wouldn't do it. He loves us that much. He refused to just wipe us totally out. So uh, it's a story about God's love, and it's also an example of obedience to God. It's a story about three things that I want to talk about today. The first one is position. You can write that down if you're taking notes. Position. The second one is posture. And the third one is payoff. Position, posture, and payoff. Amen? Amen. So I want you to turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 6, if you have your Bibles. And I'm going to try to move through this really quickly. So I'll read for you. It says, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sound familiar? Sound kind of like something that's going on right now? Um, if you don't think so, you need to stop and take a really good look at what's going on around you. Watch the news one day. Right? They got 24-hour news, and all 24 hours of it is bad. Come on now. Come on. I know, because I watch it. I do. I ain't going to lie. Y'all be watching Basketball Wives. I'll be on CNN. Okay. Right? And, um, and it's all bad. There's some really wicked stuff going on today. Not only is there wicked stuff going on today, there's wicked stuff that we're calling okay now. And I said we because there's many of us in the church who make it okay too. So I want to talk about that today. Um, so, uh, and he was, the Lord said, he was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Verse eight, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Um, so the, the, the word grace is really telling right there, right? We all know what grace means, right? It's unmerited favor, right? So it, it goes on in, in the next verse to say that um, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. But the fact that he found grace, unmerited favor, tells me that Noah was not perfect, right? 
As a matter of fact, it would have been pretty difficult to be perfect when you're surrounded by evil everywhere. Right? So I want to get that straight. We're not talking about a perfect man, but we are talking about the Bible does go on to say that Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. Not perfect, but Noah is walking with God. God, I want to be with you. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to be right, God. Even when I'm wrong, Lord, I'm sorry, I want to be right, God. Noah walked with God, and he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So the question for us today is, so what Noah did was he put himself, by the way he walked, in position for God to use him. Position. How you live your life will determine whether or not you are in position for God to use you. Understand what I'm saying. How, when you go to work, are you just like everybody else on your job? When you're in the club, It got quiet. You can hear crickets. <laughs> Who he talking about? He ain't talking about me. <laughs> no, 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 no. For real, for real, for real. We're gonna be. We're gonna. Can can I keep it real? Wherever you are, when you're there, how do people look at you? Do they look at you as one of them? Do you fit in like that? You should think about that, right? Yeah. Like when you're hanging out with the boys, right? How are they looking at you? So the reason I know this is because I spent a good portion of my life trying to fit in. Now, it never, ever, ever worked. Because God had a different plan for me. I was just different. And I just it took me a whole lot of years to accept that and embrace that and say, okay, God, I surrender. But I was just different. But I was always trying to fit in. In order to fit in, I need to do what other people are doing. I need to talk the way other people talk, right? So we need to ask ourselves as Christians, and I'm, I'm assuming that everybody, maybe everybody in here ain't, ain't saved, but, but I, I'm looking around the room, and it looks like there's a bunch of us in here. But we need to ask ourselves all the time, all the time, am I in position? Am I walking in my position as a child of the king? Am I walking upright before God? Am I walking with God at all? I don't know about you, but, but in the spirit of full disclosure, sometimes I make decisions all by myself. I'm still learning. I'm, I'm, I'm still growing. I'm still evolving. I'm learning. And I make decisions, and I just be gone. I get way down there and figure I'm on the wrong road. Come on now. Come on. Right? Now I'm running. <laughs> right? I'm trying to get back. That's what the children of God do. We get back. Because we know. <laughs> Amen? It don't mean we don't make bad decisions. Or we don't, you, you know, do that human thing, right? That human thing, right, that makes us do that kind of stuff. But, but a child of God will know as soon as you get, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Amen? So I need to be behaving in a way everywhere I go that people say there is something different about him. My coworkers say, you crazy. Yep. Yes, I am. I am like you wouldn't believe, right? And, um, and so people need to find you peculiar. If they find you peculiar, if you find yourself not fitting in, if you find that you're different from everybody else, you're probably walking just the way you're supposed to be. Amen? 
position. You need to be in position. Listen, I chose my wife because I, we were in this, at this convention in San Jose, and I saw her, and something about her stood out to me, right? She stood out. Amongst all, there was thousands of people there, and trust me when I tell you, it was a whole bunch of women. <laughs> and I was not thinking, I wasn't walking with God. <laughs> I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw my wife and something stood out about her. She stood out in the crowd. If you think about when you chose your wife or your husband, something stood out. So you chose them or they chose you. I tend to think that women choose men and, that's, and, and then they make us think we chose them. <laughs> uh, but... um. But we choose them because they stick out in some way, right? There's something about them, right? God chooses us the same way. God chooses people who stand out to him. So we want to walk in a way that we stand out to God, amen? So, you know, you, you had to think about Noah. Not, not, it had to be pretty rough on him because, you know, here's Noah. He's, God tells him this message. He don't tell nobody else. He just tells Noah, right? He tells Noah that he's going, it's going to rain and, and it's going to flood. And so I want you to build this boat and I want you to make it a, make it a 30 of these wide and thir I mean 30 of these high and 30 of these wide, a cubit. You know what a cubit is? That's what a cubit is. The measurement from here to here, right? So 30 cubits high, 50 cubits wide, right? 300 cubits long. And he gives him all these measurements, right? And uh, he don't tell nobody else, right? So you got to think that he's in this wicked world, right? And, and there's all these people watching him doing this, including his family, who don't know nothing about what God said to him, Right? Can you imagine how hard it was for Noah to get up every day and still work on this boat? Can you imagine how difficult it must have been to walk with God, right? So I'm saying that to say in the midst of trying to walk with God, it, there is going to be some tough times. There's going to be some lonely times. There's going to be some times when, 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 you, when you really don't want to. I'm just keeping it real. When it's real difficult. You want to make the other choice, Right? But what makes us stand out to God is when we make the choice to follow him despite how difficult it is. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we want to stand out to God. We need to be in position. Right? So uh, later on in chapter 6, um, the, the thing that really stood out to me about the story of Noah is, and they made this whole movie about Noah, but really if you read the text, Noah doesn't say anything. Nothing. Nothing. God gives him all these instructions. And then in chapter 6, verse 22, the Bible says, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So he did. He never says a word. He never says, Lord, what are you talking about? Rain. I never seen no rain. He doesn't say anything. He just does as he's instructed, right? So he doesn't speak. He doesn't question God. He doesn't talk back. The message in that, when God tells you something, just obey. Shut up. Just be quiet. Matter of fact, it's better if you be quiet because you start talking and you can convince yourself to not do the very thing that God has asked you to do, right? Right? So uh, Pastor Moore was talking about the job I got, and, and I almost moved myself out of position when God was trying to move me in position to get the job. So I was working in Marin, and I had been on the job for about five years, and I was really frustrated, and I was tired, and I finally made a decision to talk to God about it. And I said, Lord, I'm really wanting to go. Lord said, go. <laughs> go? Okay. So I applied for a job. First job I applied for, they called me. Here was the catch. They wanted to pay me the same amount of money I was already making, and I had to commute to San Francisco instead of Marin. 
right? Don't sound like a good decision, right? But I asked God, I said, God, uh, should I go? God said, go. Now, on top of that, it was in working in the Tenderloin, right, on Turk Street, in the heart of probably the worst area in San Francisco. Lord, should I go? Go. Okay. So I went. Right after I went, the car broke down. So I had to catch casual carpool to San Francisco every day and then catch the button bus in the BART. I mean, the, the BART down. I would walk from the casual carpool to the BART and then catch the BART down the Embarcadero and then walk up to my job. Now, the cool part was it only cost me $6 a day to commute, right? But I was walking in the cold and the rain, <laughs> walking. Now, this is the part I need to tell you because this is different for me. I don't know about y'all, it's different for me. Every day when I got up, I would have to walk from my apartment on Carolina Street downtown to the park and ride, which is on Cartola Parkway, almost to the freeway, right? It was a 30-minute walk, brisk, a 30-minute brisk walk. <laughs> there was mornings when it was 27 degrees, right? And I'm going to tell you what I did every single morning. I woke up. And I praised God all the way to the parking ride. And I thanked him for a job. And I thanked him that it only cost me $6 to get to work. And I thanked him that I wasn't getting wet even though I was freezing to death. And, and I did that every day, right? And I went to work and I didn't complain. And when I got over there to San Francisco, as soon as I hit the Tenderloin, I started praying. Because I needed to pray to get through that area. Y'all know where the Tenderloin is? And then I had to pray all day at work because these people would come in my office. And I'm talking about there's demons walking in my office every day. And so I had to pray and I had to pray and I had to pray and I had to pray. And so finally, God blessed us with the opportunity to buy a car. Actually, the only other car we had broke down too. So we had to buy a car, right? So it wasn't that I was now going to be able to drive to work. I was buying a car so my wife could try to work because she blew up my car. And she was driving my car because I wrecked her car. <laughs> right? So, 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 um, so we buy this car, right? We go and we buy the car. And then they tell us how much the note is. It's over $400. And so I go home. And when my wife is gone one day, I'm on my knees in the room and I say, Lord! Help me pay this car off. So I don't want to say that in front of my wife. I don't want to be worried. Because if I'm worried, she's broke down. <laughs> it's a wrap. It's the end of the world. <laughs> so I need to keep it together. So, so three days later, the phone rings. About three or four days, maybe a week. The phone rings. And it's this guy who had been my client. Right? In treatment called me and said, hey, man, you ready? Yeah. Ready for what? <laughs> Overnight, my salary doubled. Woo! Bam. Woo! And uh, I obeyed God, Amen. even though it didn't look like it was such a smart decision. Now, here's the thing. He wouldn't have called me if I was still working at the place I was working before because he couldn't. He couldn't pull me from there. He had a relationship with those people. So God already knew this. So he moved me from there so I could be in position to do what he has me doing now. Position. It's important. So I want to move on. I want to talk about posture. Posture. So Verse 22 says, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded, so did he. He didn't speak. He didn't question God. He didn't talk back. So listen, sometimes when God tells you to do something or you hear something and, you, and you, you're feeling like this is what I believe God wants me to do, you need to not question him and just move. Move into action. And not worry about how it's going to work out. So that goes against everything that is human. 
It don't make no sense. It makes absolutely no human sense to do that. If I'm scared and my fear is telling me don't do it, that's my humanness telling me don't do it. But if I have faith in the God who told me to do it, then I have to have enough faith to, to trust that he'll work it out. That he'll work it out. So um, I'll, let me tell you what posture is. Posture is, here's a definition for you, a conscious mental or outward behavioral attitude. A conscious mental or outward behavioral attitude. So we already talked about Noah and how God gives him all these instructions and all he does is do what he's told. Nothing else. He doesn't mumble, he doesn't complain, he doesn't groan, he doesn't do any of that. He just goes into action and he does what he's told. There's a word for that. It is called obedience. Obedience. So I'm, I'm blessed to be in this wonderful class right now called Spiritual Authority with Pastor Matt. And, and I'm taking this class, and, and in three weeks, it's changed me and my wife's life. It has completely changed the way that we operate in, in, in some ways and think about certain things. When you understand the, uh, the importance of being obedient to authority. And then, then when you understand that, that there's uh, one of the things, you've, the first things we learned in the class is there's only, there's two sets of principles at work in the earth at all times. One of them is God's principles and the other one's is Satan's principles. Yeah. You're either operating under one or the other. Two sets of principles, Right? And then as the class progresses and you start to realize uh, some of the things that are, are underneath Satan's principles, you're like, oh, my God, I'm the devil. <laughs> I mean, but you really, and, 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 and it does exactly what it's supposed to do if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, convict you, convict you, and move you to action. But, but what we're learning is how important obedience is. And, and where it will lead you. So what Noah did was take on a posture of obedience. He didn't talk. He just did what he was supposed to do. He did what he was told. He postured himself in obedience. A posture of obedience. Write that down. We need to have a posture of obedience. We need to position ourselves by walking with God. And we need to maintain a posture of obedience. Now. Sometime obedience mean um, obeying people you don't like. So the other thing that we learned in spiritual authority is right there was a, a there's a huge amount of authorities. Like everybody's under authority, and everybody that's in authority is under authority. You can't be in authority without being under authority, right? So uh, there's some people that work for me, right? I work for somebody. He worked for somebody, and he worked for some people, right? And those people answer to some people, right? So there's an authority. Ultimately, the authority for us is God. So what we have to do is trust that God, who puts people in authority, right, knows what he's doing, right? So when you're obeying your boss who's telling you something and you don't want to do it because you don't like him anyway, Right? And you should be in his job because you could do it better than him. Right? All of that stuff is coming up. Right? You need to obey anyway because that's what God would have you to do. And you need to never undermine his authority. Ever, ever, never, ever. Because God will do something to us for that. There's a consequence for that. There's a consequence. Our pastor talks all the time about how he had to quit a job because he undermined somebody's authority, right? And it was real simple. He, it happened so fast, like, pow, he just said something. Whoop, 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 whoop. 
And everybody cheered him on. Yeah, yeah. And he knew right away that he had gone too far. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. Amen? Amen? Obedience. Obedience. A posture of obedience. Amen? Amen. So um, flip over to chapter 7 real quick. I want to get to the point here. So Noah tells, uh, the Lord says to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, blah, 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 right? And, and he takes all, tells him what to do. And so Noah and his wife, verse 7, and his son's wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Uh, Uh, let's drop down to verse 15. It says, and they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, talking about the animals, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female, of all flesh went in as God had commanded him. This is the part I want you to listen to. And the Lord shut him in. So I'm reading at night, right? I'm doing my little Bible reading, right? And I get to that verse and I go, pow! And the Lord shut him in. It didn't say he went in the ark and they closed the door and then it started raining. It said, and, and so this really stuck out to me, right? And the Lord shut him in, right? And, and I, I started thinking about why that's significant. And then I started thinking about what happens when I shut the door on stuff, right? So when I shut the door on stuff, I shut the door, yeah, it's over, blam! <laughs> right? Or, I'm sorry, come back in, right? I started thinking about how when we shut the door sometimes, that's this is me under my own will, right? How things don't work out. And not only do they not work out, many times when I think I'm shutting the door for a good reason, I'm actually shutting the door on God. I don't know what I'm doing, y'all. I don't know about y'all. You may think you know what you're doing. But if you're operating outside of God, then you're going to have to answer to that. There's going to be some consequences to that. And normally, they're not that good. I can tell you, I've done it a lot. I'm pretty good at that. And so, the Lord shuts the door. We have a tendency to want to open the door again. Or look back. Or go back to where we came from. Or let the very people in that should be outside. Right? Right? Maybe the, door, maybe the Lord did tell you to shut the door. But you open it back up and let dude up in there. He didn't tell you to bring him in and shut the door. He didn't tell you to bring her in and shut the door. He said shut the door. Obedience. But it says the Lord shuts the door. Listen, if God shuts the door, he can be on the outside, shut the door, and be on the inside with you too. You need to think about that for a minute. He can shut the door on the outside, seal it up so nobody else will get in because if he shuts the door, it's shut. Right? And be on the inside with you. So he shuts the door, right? And Noah and his family and all these animals, oh, I can't imagine being in there with all the animals. I don't even like going to the zoo. And them animals is outside. Can you imagine me an inside? And there was one window. And I just told you the door was shut. <laughs> Sometimes we need to let God shut the door. This came up for me the other day. I actually, I think I posted it on Facebook. If we let God do the fighting for us, right, then we don't have to never worry about losing. And we don't even have to break a sweat. None to trip on. Let God shut the door. Right? 
so uh, this is significant for a few other reasons. What came up for me is that, uh, what this kind of signified for me is uh, sometimes um, God needs to move you. God needs to put you in position. He needs to move you. He needs to get you away from where you are or maybe who you're with or who you're around so that he can use you for his purposes, right? Uh, and when God wants to remove you from a situation or a thing, we need to just obey him and allow God to close the door. You don't need to worry yourself about how the door will be closed, nor how the next door will be opened. So think about Noah's going in here and God closed the door and now you're in his boat. Oh, we don't know how we get out. They never, you never read a word about Noah complaining. Now I'm sure his family did. I am sure his wife did. I know if it was my wife. After four the day, after after four hours, I'd have been begging God, please let me out of this boat. <laughs> Cause she's gonna be worried. Oh my God, listen to that. Right? But again, we need to maintain an obedient posture when it comes to the things of God. Listen, here's the other thing. I got, to, I got to thinking about how Noah, here was Noah, right? And he's in this environment with all these wicked people and he gets this word from God to build the ark and he builds the ark. Uh, and overnight, God calls basically this supernatural event to happen that totally changed not only his life, but his family's life and the course of history. Listen, God is able to take your situation that you're in right now and do something so spectacular that you never thought could happen and change your circumstance from what it is to what it needs to be in an instant. In an instant. When we position and posture ourselves. So that was the key. He positioned and postured himself in obedience. And because of that, he was able to bring about this supernatural thing that happens. So, um, so we need not put limits, and we've heard this over and over in this church. We should not put limits on God. That this is the God that raised Jesus from the dead. This is the foundation of our Christian belief, right? And if we can believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, why do we not believe that can re he can raise up our raggedy relationships? Why don't we believe that he can uh, bless us with a job? Why don't we believe that he can pull us out of those situations that we whine and complain about all the time? Yes. Instead of whining and complaining, maybe you need to position yes. and posture yourself. Yes. Listen, all heaven or hell can be breaking loose around you and God can use that situation to change your life for the better. They in this ark, man, and it's storming outside. And these are some people that never seen rain, right? So they in here in this boat, it's one window, they in here with all these stinking animals and it's rocking and oh my God, and they have no clue what's gonna happen. But they were obedient, but they were obedient. So uh, one more thing about posture. When you position and posture yourself, God can put you in the very vehicle needed to move you from one season to another one, from one situation to another one, from, one, from the last wife to the next wife, from the last husband to the next husband, from the house that you lost to the house that you're going to get. From the job that went away to the new one that he's been preparing for you. When you position and posture yourself in obedience, he can use your obedience to bless you. So remember, it was position, posture, and payoff. So in chapter 8, um, there's more obedience, right? So the, the, the boat finally comes to rest. 
right? And he sends out the bird. Bird flies around, comes back, sends out another bird. Bird flies around, comes back, sends out another bird. Bird comes back with the olive branch. Now, at that point, I'd have been ready to get up out the boat. Let's go! It's time to get out of here. Sick of being in here, right? But he didn't do that. Noah doesn't make a move until God tells him to. Noah doesn't make a move until God tells him to, right? So he's moving you. He puts you in a vehicle. It might be a little uncomfortable, right? Where you are right now, you might be in your ark right now. You may be in your ark right now. Feel like that? Right now. It ain't cool. All hell is breaking loose. All hell is breaking loose. But if God shut the door, you can best believe that you're headed for your payoff. See, there's some benefit to obeying God. Amen? So, so Noah doesn't do anything without being instructed. We need to pay attention to that. Sometimes we want to jump the gun. I do. One time this old man told me that. I got in this relationship and he called me in this office. He said, sit down, son. Sit down. Sit down. You know, I thought I knew what I was doing. Sit down. He's about 80 years old. And he looked at me, he said, you know, you're pretty sharp, but you make your move too fast. <laughs> I never forgot that. <laughs> but you need to ask yourself, would you have left the boat? I probably would have left the boat. Maybe not now in my life, because I understand the the rewards of obedience. I understand how, how, what the payoff is for obedience. I also understand the consequences of disobedience. Yeah. Now here's the catch, right? Is we get to do whatever we want to. I can do whatever I want to. I can say whatever I want to. Right? Well, at least that's what they tell us in this country, right? Yeah. We got rights. I got the right. Right? So with God, I have no rights. And I'm okay. I have the right not to have any rights. I have the right to be obedient. Right? I have some rights. The rights I do have, he gives to me. He gives to me. Because of my obedience. Amen? So in chapter 9, they go through, he finally, God tells him to leave the boat, right? And uh, so he gets out, and it says, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is blood. And he tells him all the things that he can do and that he cannot do. But the point is this. God took Noah, who had positioned himself by walking with God. Right? And he had maintained an obedient posture through a impossible situation. I really don't know that anybody in here could do what Noah did. It's just, it's, it's amazing that he was able to be obedient through those circumstances. Just imagine if everybody in this room was telling you not to do what God called you to do. Telling you that you're wrong. These are the people you've been knowing your whole life. Maybe even your family, they're telling you, don't do it. Don't do it. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Right? Could you obey God? Would you obey God? Well, let me tell you what the benefit is of obeying God. So not only 
did God bless Noah. God blessed his children and anybody connected with him. All of his family. As a matter of fact, Noah, everybody in here is related to Noah. God used Noah to repopulate the whole earth. If that's not a blessing, God started all over with one man who was in position and postured himself in obedience. Listen, God wants to bless us. He wants to bless us. We read it over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. He wants to bless us, right? Many times we blow off our blessings because of our disobedience. And because we refuse. Listen, I, I just told you there's no way I would have. Let, let me tell you one more thing and then I'm, I'm going to be done in a minute. So in December, my, the executive director, the same guy who hired me, got angry with me about something. Something happened at my facility and somebody else got involved. And then by the time I reported it to him, it was a couple days later and nothing came out of it. But it was something that was pretty serious. And so he was angry. He was angry with me. And uh, so in his anger, he decided that um, he was going to make a woman who was uh, a direct report to me my equal, and he was going to cut my pay $10,000, right? And uh, so I'm like, uh, so he tells me this, right? No, he didn't tell me. Somebody else told me. This human resources guy, right, tells me. And so I go talk to him, right? And I say, hey, listen, uh, I heard about what you said, um, and I, I hear what you're saying. He was saying basically that we were going to split the duties in the program, right, me and this lady. And so that was his justification for doing what he was doing. And, uh, and I said, I hear what you're saying, but if you really take a look at what you're saying, it's that's not actually what's happening. And so I'm going to continue to do all the work, and you're going to cut my pay. But he was angry, right? So anyway, it didn't happen. At least not right away, right? So sometime in January, was it January? Later in January. This was like early December before Christmas. Like middle of January or something. I'm in his office, and it's payday. Right? And I'm having this conversation with him, and he's talking to me, and he's saying stuff, don't worry about it, man, it's going to be cool. And I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I have no idea. That's because I hadn't picked up my paycheck. <laughs> so I pick up my paycheck, and they cut my pay. Right? So when I'm having this conversation, I didn't know anything about it. Right? And as soon as I got the paycheck, God said to me, don't say a word. Do not say nothing about this money. Don't say a word. Don't go in there begging for no money. He said, you're still making way more money than you was making. Don't worry about it. I got you. Right? And he did. It's not a big thing, right? So, so I've been, I was able to obey. By the grace of God, I was able to obey. I didn't say a word. And I told my wife I wasn't going to say a word. And she was like, I would go up in there and I would tell him. And you need to talk to somebody. And they need to give you your money back now. That's my wife. She only quiet at Revival Center. <laughs> But she was like, you need to go claim your money in the name of the Lord. Can't do that to you. But God had spoken. And he said, don't say a word. As a matter of fact, don't change how you treat them. You need to go to work and do your job. And you need to love on that man. So the, the guy who was really behind all of this was the director of human resources and so, um, and I had to love on him too. And he was a tyrant. I'm telling you, when I say he's a tyrant, I don't, I don't say those things about people lightly. He was a very, very mean man who had no soul, it seemed. He was one of those people who got, took pleasure in terminating people. I watched him do it. He did it right in front of me. He used me to set somebody up 
and then he terminated them with me sitting there after telling me that what he really was going to do was offer them a job. And so I'm sitting here thinking we're going to offer this guy a job, and he hands him his last check. So this is the guy I'm dealing with. And God is telling me I got to love on him. And he didn't take my money? So I did. I did. I would love on him. I would say kind things to him. Um, I would continue to do my job. So just this past week, um, I went to a minister. Oh, he got fired. <laughs> See, God shut the door. God shut the door. So I'd have shut the door, I probably would have got fired. Right? God shut the door. So God shuts the door, and uh, they bring in this wonderful woman. She actually lives in Vallejo, goes to church here in Vallejo, and they bring her in. So anyway, the other day I might add me in, and I'm still doing my job. I'm perky, doing my thing. How y'all doing? Hey, praise the Lord. And uh, and uh, and the executive director's in there, and he says, "Hey, hey, 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 don't leave. Hold on." And it just so happened that he was standing there with the director of programs, which is my supervisor, and the director of finance who's over the money. And they were talking about something else. And I was about to leave because I was feeling like I was intruding on their executive conversation and they said, don't leave. And then right there in front of everybody, he says, listen, I want you to make Norma a direct report to Michael as she was before and I want you to give him his money back. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Then he said, I want you to send him over to this other facility, and I want you to give him an increase for that, too. So, so listen, God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ask or think. Listen, whatever your situation is right now, whatever your situation is right now, you may be, like I said, you may be in your ark right now. It don't smell too good. It don't feel too good. You want to get up out of here. You tired of being stuck in this situation. You tired of being around these people. You just want to go. I'm telling you, you need to hold on and listen for God and obey what he told you to do. Obedience will get you to the payoff. The payoff. Listen, there's a definition for, where'd I put it? Payoff or profit. Uh, it's, it's something gained, I'm sorry, the advantage or benefit that is gained from doing something. The advantage or benefit that is gained from doing something. In this case, all of your benefit and advantage that you will gain will come from your obedience to the Father. Listen, here's the other thing I want to tell you. Everything I just told you that you should do, you really don't have a choice. As children of God, we don't have a choice. We're called to this. You don't get to walk around and act any way you want to think you want to act. You just don't. I mean, don't get me wrong. You can. You can do whatever you want to do. But you need to understand that there's going to be some consequences and some repercussions to your actions. And what you really do is uh, doing is blocking the very blessings that you get on your knees and ask God for every single night. The other thing I, I wanted to share with you before I close, and I didn't want to share this, but God told me I need to. So I told you about how not only uh, m does my obedience affect me, but it affects everybody around me. So when my pay got cut, my wife felt like her pay got cut. She acted like it too. <laughs> she was talking like it too. So when it got increased, she was hallelujah, <laughs> glory. Look, I told you not to say nothing. 
<laughs> okay? You know how y'all do us. So um, we're called to be obedient. And so the night, true story. So the night that I stay up and I write this, I go to bed and I'm asleep. And I have this really, really strong dream. And it's about obedience. And it's about, <coughs> so I'll tell you the dream. I didn't want to share this. I really didn't. Because it really, it, it, God used something that touches me very deeply. So in the dream, I'm crazy. I mean, I'm out of my mind, right? And I have lighter fluid. And I'm spraying it all over myself, right? And Michaela's there, my daughter. And I sprayed it on her too. And there was some stuff on the table and I sprayed it on her too, right? And then I have this moment of clarity. I'm like, what the heck am I doing? I'm not going to do nothing to my baby. And I sent her out of the room, right? This is all in the dream. I send her out of the room. And then I sit down and I set myself on fire. My daughter, who loves me deeply, runs into the room and tries to put the fire out. And because she's covered in the lighter fluid, she catches on fire. This is the dream. And that really affected me. You, you know it had to because usually we forget dreams, right? This was, this was a dream, and I'm sure it was good from God because when I woke up, he said to me, if you're obedient, that's what will affect her. If you're disobedient, it's going to affect her even if she doesn't see you do it. My daughter did not see me like that flame. I sent her out of the room. But she came around the corner and saw me on fire. And she loved me so much that she ran to. So we affect everyone about around us with either our obedience or our disobedience. Even if they don't see you being disobedient. So I've done a lot of things in the dark right? They always, always manifest themselves. They come out, right? And, 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 and because we're in the body of Christ, what you do affects me. What you do affects me. What I do affects you, Pastor Moore, right? So we don't have a choice. We have to walk with God. We're called to walk with God. And when we do, and we posture ourselves in obedience, God will take us from our raggedy situations to our glorious situations, from our bad feelings to our good feelings, from the old job to the new job. Hallelujah. He can do it. He's doing it right now. Right now, one of you is in transition from that place to this place. And you may not like how it feels right now. But oh, when God gets you on top of the mountain and he opens the door and lets you come out. Hallelujah. He's got a blessing for you that you won't have room enough to contain. He's able to do it. And he will. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> I don't know about you, but I get excited when I think about what God is doing in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's only the beginning for you. There's more in store when you obey him. Amen. Listen, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Uh, if there's anybody here tonight uh, and you've never given...